Sure. Well, yeah. years ago, 20 years ago, when I had eight tracks uh, by the bathroom uh, close to the classical section, it was a hot summer day, and there was this couple who came in, and they said, where are your eight tracks? And I showed them the eight tracks, and time went by, and I was wondering, I don't have a big section. What, what are they doing there? And I look up, and the guy, this big hairy guy, has his shirt off, and the woman is down to her bra, and uh, they're making out. And I went, okay, if they feel comfortable enough, <laughs> let them do it. And I was thinking, I, I can't remember what music I was playing, but I thought maybe I should put on some, uh, I guess, fucking music. <laughs> This month on Kingston Live, we talk vinyl in anticipation of Record Store Day. Vaughn Evans represents Kingston across the country on Via Rail. And after an outpouring of community support, Brian's record option finally reopens. Hello, I'm Johnny San. And I'm Riley Jabor. And this is Kingston Live, where we talk about everything happening in the first capital of Canadian music. And something not happening specifically in Kingston, but across the country and I guess around the world, Record Store Day is uh, April 13th. Riley, are you going to be hitting the record stores on Record Store Day? You know what's funny is I kind of forgot that it hadn't happened yet because last weekend, I mean, at the time of this recording, it'll be further than last weekend, but with uh, Brian's reopening, it kind of felt like its own Record Store Day. And I was like, oh, no, I'm missing out on everything because I was busy. It was a a weekend. I had a bunch of stuff going on. And now I'm just remembering like, oh, no, there's still still time. It's like waking up from the the dream at uh, when you're Scrooge in... Uh, th- that analogy fell apart, but you know, <laughs> it's exciting, is what I'm saying. It is. So uh, you didn't get to Brian's on his opening? No, it was my girlfriend's birthday this weekend, so we were busy doing uh, stuff for her. And uh, but I saw all kinds of really great reaction from it, and I'm very jealous of uh, the halls. I saw my friends posting on Facebook. Yeah, well, and of course, um, we did speak to Brian uh, about uh, a week before he had his grand reopening. Uh, that'll be a little later in the show. I was talking to uh, actually Matt from Something Else Records. We'll be talking to him a little later as well. Uh, I stopped into his store and he was talking about Record Store Day and uh, he said there was like a... um some unreleased Marvin Gaye stuff that was coming out for Record Store Day. So I'm I'm looking forward to checking that out too. Nice. Lots of fun. Uh, Riley Jabor, do you want to formally introduce our guest? Yeah, let's go for it. Bon Evans is no stranger in the Kingston singer-songwriter community. Since 2012, Bon has performed his mix of folk, country, and rock to almost every spot in the city with a microphone, plus a few places that don't. He's brought his acoustic guitar and hat to bars, cafes, clubs, halls, and more than a handful of open-air festivals. But offstage, Bon has worked to enrich the local music community. Bon has also applied his talents to several charities, including including the Rock for Dimes and Kingston's own instrument lending library, Joe's Mill. Bond joins us today, fresh off a tour across Canada as part of Via Rail's Artists on Board program, where he performed for passengers en route from Toronto to Vancouver. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much. That was a uh, quite the professional spiel there. Is that all about me, really? Wow. That's, That's as professional you... as I get. Okay, okay. <laughs> and he didn't write it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was uh, it was quite the tour, I gotta say, guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be in here. Thank you for uh, inviting me down to have a great talk off. Yes, thank you for joining us today. So most music venues are relatively stationary. What's it like playing on board a moving vehicle across the country? This is a very unique opportunity. Yeah, I got to say it was uh, definitely an interesting opportunity. Uh, some of my favorite times were when the train was stopped dead. We were, you know, sitting somewhere just waiting for another train to pass by or whatever it might be. And then uh, I could break out the nice light acoustic playing stuff with my fingers, just nice light stuff, singing really nice with the melodies. And uh, it, it really hit the audience in a different way because because for the most part, when the train was moving, I had to use the pick, and I had mm-hmm. to play the songs that were a little bit more pronounced, you know, something that had a little bit more oomph. So how did you get involved in the Artists on Board program? What was that 
process like? Because it's not every day that someone says, hey, do you want to play on a train going across the country? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting offer, that's for sure. So when I first started playing, I had a friend, uh, Melanie Brule. She plays in Toronto. And actually, when she got started playing, she was in Kingston in the exact same studio that I got started playing, which is my stepfather's studio, the home studio, as you call it, right? Um, she ended up starting uh, just, you know, singing one day in there and we we're all like, wow, you got this amazing voice. And so she started recording just one little song here and there. And then uh, when it back out to Toronto, did a whole bunch more work. Now she's touring all over the place, working on in part of the uh, Canadian government as well. So it's great to see what she's doing. But uh, she recommended a while ago to me, go on this train, check out this train. It's an amazing thing. They've accepted me onto the same program. I didn't want to jump on at the time because I was nowhere near as confident as I am now <laughs> as a solo performer. Um, I was just starting, so I, I was kind of like, thank you for the offer. And then almost like every year after that, somebody came out of the woodworks, oh, Bon, you got to try this thing, you know. And <laughs> there's always a great musician that I really respect it, too. And uh, they, they've heard me play solo right in front of them. And they're like, I love it. You got to do this. You just got to get it out there. But sometimes uh, putting your heart out there is not as easy when you're you're doing it solo, when you have the full band up there, it's kind of like, yeah, all right, just I messed up, but nobody else is paying attention, really. So you know, <laughs> they're thinking it was the drummer, probably, right? So <laughs> always blame the drummer. That's yeah. what I always do, and he's my dad too. So <laughs> <laughs> he just loves it. One time, I was pretty sure he was gonna throw a stick at the back of my head. Just here you go, Bon. <laughs> yeah. Are there any sort of, in addition to the, the sound space, any other challenges playing on a moving vehicle? Because I know when I like when I'm on the train, just using the bathroom is hard enough. They've got like <laughs> the place is replete with those support bars, and it's still a struggle to to move your way around. Like, how oh, do you yeah. play music? Yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And the washroom is uh, quite the task, as well as the shower, because uh, on this long trip, oh, you yeah. get actually have, have a shower, right? So sitting there crouching down and bending around and trying to get into the water. It was good. It wasn't horrible. I'm not going to badmouth the train, you know. Uh, well, not not much, at least. Well, it's a great way to travel. Oh, it's a phenomenal way to travel. Um, the only thing that they recommend is, like, expect delays, you know, expect delays. But um, as far as playing on the train, the differences that I would notice between playing from class to class, and which is an interesting thing because my mom never really raised me with seeing people in classes, um, but I got to see like the economy class, the sleeper class, and the prestige class. And playing the songs might not be the same. Okay. You don't might not want to play. They keep requesting something else down here, whereas up in the uh, prestige classes, they'd always really love the original music. But in economy, I just keep getting these shout outs for, you know, uh, you know, play this, play, play that. Play Freebird. Yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> You know, some of them I could accommodate, but uh, yeah, I just, I like to stick to the originals for the most part. Mm -hmm. And I played three times a day. So I got to play in the economy and this middle viewing car and then the very back bullet, which is the prestige car, which I mean, most of the cabin people will go back there too. Um, as well as playing in Winnipeg, Toronto, Vancouver, uh, Saskatoon and Jasper. I played in all their stations. So I didn't get to go out into the city, but I did get to go into the station. And my favorite pl station playing for was Jasper because those people were already at like a 15 hour delay. So some of them were sleeping in that place. Some of them were sitting there for hours, just totally depressed and hating the V-Rail at this point. Right. Yeah. And then I walk in there and I start playing and this Russian girl comes up to me, was on the train. She says, you have to have my friend come play with you right now. And I'm like, all right, sounds good. And uh, so she grabs one of these three German girls to come over and play with me. She's about 18 or 19. She comes up. She's like, I don't know any of your songs. I'm like, that's all right. You just sing along to whatever you do know or just, you know, hum along, whatever. And she starts like belting out during some of the songs. Um, I ended up playing with her Ed Sheeran's Perfect because she knew that one. And like the crowd just like started like leaning forward and sitting up and they're like, oh, this is, this is nice. I like this. And by the time we were done, they're just screaming and applauding and just having so much fun. And I thought that was going to be it. But when I got back onto the train, I have all these people constantly coming up to me, be like, you know how much you changed my day today? Like, honestly, I was about to kill those train people. And then <laughs> you came out and I just said, thank you very much. Got my ticket and walked right back onto the train. I was like, I don't even care. I'm on the train, whatever. So to change people's day, that was a nice little perk, I got to say. Nice. Yeah. My uh, my favorite part was this, is that the staff said that they've never seen this before. Uh, the people from the Prestige car, they pay a, a very high amount to take on one of the very, very nice, you know, rooms up at the 
back of the train, which is a whole other story because the back of the train just goes wah, 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 wah. It's super, um, what's the word? Wobbly, flimsy, back sure. and forth. Yeah. All those I was going to say work. turbulent, but I, I, I'm not sure if that applies to trains. I know that people thing. can't see my hands moving like this, so I'm just like, damn. They look like windshield wipers, if you want to imagine yeah. that at home. Everybody at home, yeah, my hands are windshield wipers. So, uh, But the Prestige gets it you know, really wobbly. But anyways, uh, this is the first time that they saw that the pre- Prestige class walked all the way back to the economy class just to listen to the music. So I ended up having like the economy class filled up with people that were from, you know, the higher classes just to listen to the music, tap along, sing along. And I was just, I was amazed by that. From what I understand, you have been playing all that long, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Um, when did you start playing? So I started playing when I was 25. I'm 33 now. So that's eight years that I've been playing, period. And uh, then I released music almost like the first year or so that I started uh, playing. It was maybe six months into playing that I started writing my own songs. I might have picked up like three cover songs. And then I had it in me just to write a song. I wrote a song. I wrote another song. I really liked that. It was so much more enjoyable than playing other people's music. So I kind of just went down that trajectory for a while. The funny thing was is that when I did eventually like pick up another song to learn, it almost formed how I was writing songs. So I said to myself, I'm like, oh, I got to stop learning other people's music for for right now. I'm just going to get whatever's in me out. And then when that's out, then I'll start picking up other people's music. Now, 25 is is kind of late for most musicians. And most guys kind of start in their teens or even younger. What what inspired this at, at that age? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so I, I do have a very musical family. Like my grandfather played in front of the Queen seven times in the Army. Oh. Um, my dad's traveled all across America and Canada back in the 80s he actually had the tragically opening for him in Kingston back uh, when he was in the band called the freeze Hmm. and it was uh, about 24 years old it wasn't doing so great a little bit broke on things looked at these three guitars that I did have that were just you know kind of hand-me-downs that are sitting around I kind of felt like I have nothing in right now I might just want to pawn these and pick them up later just because I have no knowledge of how to play these whatsoever and they're just like extra things in the house at this point one of these things I've got to pick up and learn how to play I turned on the YouTube I picked up some random guy online showing me how to play random chords whatever took me about I don't know the first day to get down to like three or four or five random chords where I could start playing along campfire songs and I was enjoying that you know just playing that kind of thing but at least then I wasn't going to be pawning these guitars because you know, there were presents from one was actually like older than I was. So it was just kind of like a family heirloom that somehow sitting at my house for the last 15 years kind of thing. And uh, the other one, I think my stepdad actually got it for me, trying to entice me into being a guitar player, which is a whole other story on itself. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, I was that kind of brings me to a question I had, because we've talked about how the Kingston music scene is kind of uh, this woven fabric. If everybody plays with everybody and this guy in this band plays with this guy in this other band and blah, blah, blah. But your band is unique in that you play in your band with you, your dad and your stepdad, which most people wouldn't expect that uh, those to be people mm-hmm. that would hang out in most family situations. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. How did that come to be? Uh, well, so my dad, um, him and my mother split when I was young, 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 young. And then he went and toured around Canada with another band, got his sound engineering degree out in Vancouver, at, or maybe in Toronto. I'm not sure where he got that exactly. But uh, my mom met my stepdad later on in life. I think I might have been, I don't know, 12 or 13, 14. I forget exactly how old again. But uh, years go by, my dad and my stepdad form a band somehow. And for days and days, months, weeks, years, whatever, they always ask me, you should join the band with us. And I had no intention to do that. And it was at that like 22 to 25 window where they were trying to tell me that, right? I kind of rejected that for, I don't know, a year or two. And then on my own accord, I uh, was not around the house that much. And I just started picking it up on my own. And then it was about a year into it. So so to answer the question, how I started with my stepdad was that... Um, I was writing these songs at home. I came over to my mom's place. My stepdad and my mom heard me playing one of the songs. My mom said, will you record one of these songs in our studio? Record it, one of the songs. It was a cover song. I think it was uh, Save Tonight. 
what's that one? Who's that one by? Oh, uh, Eagle Eye Cherry. Eagle Eye yeah. Cherry, yeah. Saved the night. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we did that one. And it was cool listening back to it. It was the first time ever doing something like that. Got to hear it. Dave's like, just sounds awesome. You should do more of this stuff. And I said, I don't really like doing the other person's song, though. Can we record one of mine? And uh, we tried this song out every day. I put it on there. He laid down some wicked electric guitar. We worked on some drum beats for it. And I think my acoustic and some background vocals. And it worked out pretty good. It sounded awesome. I think we got like 12 songs together and then decided to start playing. Uh, got my dad involved almost right away, like as soon as we needed a drummer for the recordings. And uh, yeah, just started playing right right away almost. It was kind of weird, I got to say, jumping up there within like a year of actually learning how to play music and ever really being on stage to confront people. Um, it was it was hard for me to just like forget every word you have in your head, forget the chords as they're shaking and you're just sweating and just like, <laughs> what is happening right now? And, and it's not even like, you know, in a, a big gig, it's someone's backyard where they're all drunk and barely even listening to you. But, you know, <laughs> the first your, time you play for strangers is really hard. Either way. Yeah, yeah. In your head, everyone's staring at you with their cameras. And it's like no one's looking at you, period. But mm -hmm. eh, it is what it is. You are very involved in one of the coolest things, in my opinion, about Kingston, and that is Joe's Mill. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is one of the best kept secrets about Kingston. Yeah. Even people in this city aren't fully familiar with it and don't know just what an amazing uh, establishment it is, what an amazing institution. Did you kind of get a chance to humble brag about Joe's Mill while you were traveling across the country on the train? Were other communities impressed by such a cool organization? Yeah, yeah, I definitely talked about them. Um, I, I didn't find one person that wasn't impressed by that. They they were completely shocked about something like that, just because in so many of the different communities they don't have anything like that. And the really interesting thing about the train is there's about eighty percent um, people that are not from Canada, so you get to meet people from all over the world, and none of them have something like that back home, which was you know astonishing because music is this thing that we can all relate to, and it's the one thing that. You know, just like math, okay, we can speak it from no matter what language we're, we're country we're from. Math is math. Well, music is kind of the same thing, universally speaking. It's like if you're not adding vocals or lyrics in there, then we can add anything we want in there. And people from anywhere in the moon could probably understand it, you know, oh, if there's people on the moon. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, my point, though, right? Like music is one of those, you know, universal connecting things. So it's great to see that uh, Joe's Mill is doing what they're doing and, um, I just started working for them last year, which was an absolutely incredible opportunity for me just to start helping them with their social media. And then I'm now on the board of directors helping them out with wh whatever opportunity I can help out with. Basically, we have uh, Homegrown coming up, which is uh, directly, you know, benefits Joe's Mill and helps them out. So that's a great opportunity for, you know, citizens to come out and check out like, oh, geez, like 100 bands or something like that playing across the city. Yeah. Yeah. And we did want to talk about Homegrown as well, because uh, we mentioned off mic that uh, we're going to be doing a festival edition of the Kingston Live podcast, but it'll be a little late for Homegrown. Is there anything else you can tell us about uh, the Homegrown festival coming up and your involvement in it? Yeah, so in the past, Homegrown has taken, uh, I think it was like 10 to 15 venues downtown, and then they get, I think it's like 100 to even 150 performers to come down and perform all over the city. All you have to do is get a $10 bracelet and you can go visit each one of those venues, check out the musicians that you want to check out or stay for the whole day at one you know venue. It's a great opportunity for people to come check out different venues, different musicians, as well as, you know, just have a fun day. Any advice for aspiring musicians? Yeah, I'd say focus on uh, original music. I, you know, I can't tell you why yet, because um, I'm not there at the point where I'm making a bunch of money off of it. Uh, I have a lot of fun writing it, creating it, recording it, uh, promoting it, performing it. And then when people finally connect with it, that's the best part. Like if I play, you know, some sort of cover I can't think of right now in my head, like uh, Sweet Caroline, that's a song, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if I play that song there and people are really connect with it, I don't know if they're connecting with me or they're connecting with that song. That's pretty awesome that people like to sing to, you know? So uh, when I play the original music, I really feel that people are, you know, turning the page and saying, I was I was judging you as soon as I heard you. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, this is kind of nice. 
I like this. And then I heard some of the words and they really spoke to me. Uh, one of my favorite times was someone saying, uh, we were just arguing in the back there, me and my friend, that that last song you played, my grandfather used to play that for me about 40 years ago when I was a kid. And I was telling my friend that he played this song for me and, you know, Germany, da, 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 blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, I wrote that one. <laughs> He's like, oh, oh, okay. All right, fine, whatever. <laughs> it's a good job, you know. That's a real good job. Reminds me of a song, obviously. It reminds me of a song I've got at that point now. But uh, yeah, so there's there's uh, ups and downs to it, of course. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, it was a good time. I liked it. It was fun. You got a nice place here. Thank you. And uh, you're gonna play a song for us? Yeah, yeah, I'll play a song. The uh, the one song that I <laughs> was getting requested a lot on the train is this uh, Happier Every Day song. It's kind of got a Cat Stevens feel to it. Um, it's interesting. You'll have to just listen to it. All right. Well, yeah. let's hear it. All right. Sounds good. Some say the better life is not far away. I'll take a better bed Any kind of day To each their own And to all the treasure true Right across the rainbow Well, an elf plays kazoo So we're trying to make the changes That make us happier every day And we're living it up today Now feeling positivity and we know that the time has come to find the good in everyone So break up the smile and cheer, my friends, be thankful we are here Beauty fades, some friendships do too Some come and go, well, others stay true The risk and reward of the adventure is pure They've got a remedy, and love is the cure. So we're trying to make the changes that make us happier every day. And we're living it up today, now spreading positivity. And we know that the time has come to find the good in everyone. So break up the smile and cheer, my friends, be thankful we are here. Well, good intentions, they fall to the floor When all you see are bad deeds, cause that's all you're looking for When right comes in your life, and you try to get along But the stress gets in your chest, and your decisions all go wrong Well, we're trying to make the changes that make us happier every day and we're living it up today, now spreading positivity. And we know that the time has come to find the good in everyone. So break up the smile and cheer, my friends, be thankful we are here. Yes, be thankful we are here. Oh, break up the smile and cheer, be thankful we are here. Break up the smile and cheer. If you have ears and you like hearing live music with those ears, <laughs> Scott Hellman, April 5th at the Brass. Michael C. Duguay will be at Musiki April 5th, and he's going to be releasing some new music, I believe, in the fall. We'll probably have him on the show at some point as well. April 10th, recent Juno winner Colin James is going to be at the Grand Theater. April 11th, Classic Albums Live doing rumors at the Grand Theater. April 12th, The Beatles' number one hits at the Grand Theater. That's not the Beatles themselves, in case you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> Same night, April 12th, Dwayne Gretzky at the Ale House. April 13th, we got Kyle Dunn at the Ale House. April 16th, Soundstreams Canada at the Isabel Bader Center. April 19th, Chris Jackson and Friends at Blue Martini. May 4th, Mark Jordan at the Grand Theater. Also May 4th, the Homegrown Live Music Festival kicking off. That will be all over downtown. That's I think it's the 11th year for that. 
Just follow your ears. You'll find something tasty. There will be something happening. May 9th, Matt Anderson and the Mellotones at the Grand Theater. The following night, May 10th, Moon vs. Sun at the Grand Theater. That's Rain Meta and Chantel Kraviasik's new project. May 19th, Sharon Bram and Friends, their farewell tour at the Grand Theater. May 17th, The Musical Box. It's a Genesis extravaganza is going down at the Grand Theater. And May 30th, Lowest of the Low at the Mansion. Live music every Monday at the Toucan. Tuesdays are open mic at Musiki and Jazz Night at Olivea. Wednesday is open mic at the Rose and Crown with Tom Savage. Friday, open mic at Spearhead. For details on these events and others, along with lots of things to do, places to eat, and places to stay in Kingston, check out visitkingston.ca. We don't tend to think there's a lot of room for older media nowadays when technology changes so quickly. When something faster, smaller, and more convenient comes along, we usually leave behind the older stuff. But then there's vinyl. After its heyday from the 50s to the 80s, vinyl lost a lot of its market share to cassettes and CDs. Then in the middle of the last decade, everything turned around. In a short time, vinyl has gone from an antiquated format found in dusty basements and thrift shop dollar bins to a once again commercially viable medium for music. In the age of streaming services, vinyl has found its niche among audiophiles, collectors, and new listeners alike. Sales of records have been steadily rising year after year since 2006, hitting 16.8 million units sold in 2018. With the vinyl boom comes a wave of new record stores, and every April, those shops and long-running stores alike join in for Record Store Day, a celebration of independent record retailers observed by shops across the world. Kingston has a number of record stores of its own, each one taking a unique approach to the formula. Today we're joined by folks from two of those stores, Jerry Miskolsi of Now and Then in the Cataraqui Center, and Matthew Robinson, owner of Something Else Records on Wellington. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Good day. Yeah, thanks for having us. And of course, Riley Jabour is here as well. Hello. <laughs> Jerry, we'll start with you. Um, okay. Now and Then uh, has a connection to a, a very famous record store brand in Canada. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, they own the last Sam the Record Man store in Canada. They started that franchise probably in 78 or 79. They also had uh, a store here at that time or in the early 80s. Um, but they chose to go back and stay in Belleville. Then when locations came up here and in Oshawa, they decided to expand but they couldn't use the Sam the Record Man name because the family wouldn't allow that. They had it as the franchise originally, so they were able to keep it. So they decided on Now and Then, and it's Now and Then Music and Movies. And Matt, you're the, the new player in town. Uh, yeah. Could you just tell us briefly why now and why Kingston and how you <clears throat> got into this? So uh, first of all, I own the store with uh, my wife, Tanya, Tanya Robinson. We actually thought of opening a record shop in Kingston back in 2006, and we were living in Toronto, and we actually moved here for about half a year to kind of feel it out, and I think it would have been a good idea, and it would have worked then as well, uh, but I think we were just too young and went back to Toronto, and then I'm glad that we did, because then I got to stay at Sonic Boom for a lot longer and learn a lot about the business there. And why now? Vinyl has been coming back, as you mentioned. Um, and it's it's a passion. We're doing it because we we love music and records, and we've always worked in retail, and uh, it's been a dream of ours. So we just thought we'd give it a go, and we did. A few months later, we had the space, and now here we are. Well, we welcome you. It's a great store. I I've already spent too much money there, <laughs> <laughs> and it's in a great spot. I like that it's next to the Duke too. Yeah, totally. just on a personal note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, Duke and Sally's too. Like that, it's dangerous for me being near Sally's. Yeah, every day. Well, yeah. I like that I can have like the best wings in Kingston at the Duke, and then buy records next door. Totally. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. wash yeah. your hands thoroughly before you <laughs> finger through the records. <laughs> <laughs> and I should mention that uh, maybe one person who is missing. Uh, is Brian, uh, of course, from Brian's Record Option. Uh, he was invited. Uh, Brian, turns out, doesn't drive, so he couldn't get here. <laughs> but we are going to speak to him a little later. So let's talk about customers. What is it about vinyl that appeals to people? There are a lot of different kind of customers that shop for records. There's a steady customer base for vinyl that's never really gone away. Um, they were buying vinyl in the 90s when no one was, and they're still buying it today. There are diggers that pretty much only buy mm -hmm, used mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and often 
uh, just kind of go in the discount bins and mm -hmm. there are collectors that come in and only look at the hundred dollar records. But what's going on now is different than that. I think it's it's the new vinyl that's that's what's different about this resurgence. It's not that all of a sudden we have all these collectors of, of rare records and, and, and diggers and stuff like that. It's that it's just a regular commonplace thing now. The new you know, who won the Grammys, the Casey Musgraves record. Mm -hmm. You know, people come mm -hmm. and buy that on, on vinyl. That's what I think different about now compared to 15, 20 years ago with vinyl. It's obviously got to be younger people that are driving this resurgence sure, yeah. of vinyl because the sort of older collectors you mentioned, I'm sure their habits have not changed. Yeah, but yeah. there's there's younger people uh, like uh, Pete, who's who writes for us and is running the desk right now. He's got way too much vinyl. <laughs> so <laughs> where, where are these people coming from? Where did this how did this happen? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with their parents, because when I was growing up, my parents listened to country music, and that was as far away as from my musical tastes as I could get. But when you flash back to 70s and 80s, those kids growing up listened to classic rock. So they were influenced by what their parents were playing. And the other thing I'll say about uh, customers is a lot of girls are buying records now. Hmm. When I started doing record shows in the late 70s and early 80s, there was one girl in the room, and it was usually a wife that was nagging the guy to go home. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want to be there, right? But now, when I had that last store in Guelph, before we moved out of Guelph, there was a 24-year-old girl, and she would come in, and she was looking for certain records to fill in her collection. And I said, well, how do you know about these bands? She said, oh, I inherited my dad's collection, and he played all these records. She knew more about the Who than I did. <laughs> and I grew up, you know, with that kind of music, right? So it's interesting that I'd say, and, and in this article I wrote in 2014, I was interviewed about vinyl records making a comeback. And I said that the girls were outselling the guys in my store three to one for the simple <laughs> fact that, like he said, the diggers and the collectors, they already had that stuff. Mm -hmm. But the girls that were coming in from the university and the college and whatever, the high school even, they didn't have all these records. They wanted these records. So I refer to Fleetwood Mac rumors. That's the biggest selling record in my store at that yeah, time. Yeah, because you and I were talking about that before. You, you <laughs> yeah. said you can't even keep that on the shelves, No, right? if we get down yeah. to 10 copies, Holly's ordering another 20, <laughs> you know, because we just can't keep it in stock. Are, are, yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask about that, actually, because it seems like every uh, every hipster I know who's just starting to get into collecting vinyl, <laughs> yeah, yeah. everybody who's just starting their collection, Rumors is their number one, and it's not like it's a something they just discovered, but it's all of a sudden over the last two or three years, it's yeah, become this yeah. staple for everybody who owns a vinyl collection. I feel embarrassed that I don't have it. <laughs> are there any other records that kind of are on that same echelon where you can't keep them on the shelves, but they're great for everybody who's digging through? Yeah, I'd say, you know, Pink Floyd, right? Dark Side of the Moon. Dark Side of the Moon is like Led one Zeppelin of the top selling four. albums every year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I remember for a yeah. while that was going gold like every yeah, year for yeah. like decades. Yeah. That's wild. I, yeah. yeah. And Eagle's Greatest Hits now this year went to number one. All time <laughs> sure. selling record. And who's buying it? All ages. Yeah. Guys and girls. Like everybody's buying that stuff now. So it is a good time. It really is a good time. And it's interesting, sort of looking back, because uh, like I, I wasn't around in the 70s, but uh, you know, my folks listened to all that stuff, and I sort of grew up with some of it. Um, and it's neat to sort of look back and recognize that a lot of it has a timelessness to it, that there are people who have liked it. It's n it never really went away, yeah. and there's younger yeah. generations who are discovering it and liking it just as much as older generations. Oh, for sure. And everybody agrees. Um, I was going to say that film that I just watched recently. Have you seen that one, Vinyl Revolution? No. It's worth watching. It's a good little half hour. And Sonic Boom is in there, and Cops Records, and then uh, Sam the Record Man. When you said that it's your passion, everybody in this film, including Tom Cochran and... Um, Alan Cross is Alan in it. Cross. Yeah. But it's in their blood. It's their passion. This is what they do. They live and breathe it 24-7. And that's why they're successful at it, and that's why they enjoy it. It's a labor of love. Well, I've so, always felt there are two types of music listeners. There are those for whom it's just merely entertainment. They like what's popular. Mm -hmm. It's sort of this this ephemeral thing. And I think for those people, you know, streaming alone is maybe sufficient. But 
then there are people for whom music is something much deeper, and vinyl is for those people. And this is the second thing I noticed in that film, and they all agree, and they all state it too in the film, is that vinyl has and always will have the best sound, best sound quality. There's a warmth to it yeah, that you yeah, can't yeah. replicate with digital technology. Yeah, and they all agree that the demand for vinyl never went away with the customer base. It was phased out by the record companies at a time when CDs were the number one oh, thing. Cheap, cheaper to yeah. make, yeah. How would you explain, let's assume somebody who's only ever heard digital music, whether it was streaming, download, or CD, how do you describe the sound of vinyl to them and why is it important? Mm. Three-dimensional. Yeah, mm. very three-dimensional for depth, sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. If you've got a really good system, and a friend of mine, Calvin, uh, he spends all his money on uh, stereo equipment. Um, you can go and he can play a four-piece jazz band, and you can close your eyes. You, you sit in the chair, which is called the sweet spot, and turn the lights down low, turn it up, and you're sitting in the middle of the recording studio, and the drums are there, and the bass is there, and the keyboards are up front, and then the sax comes in. It's just three-dimensional, like Matt said. Mm -hmm. It's like you're there. And you know? I think you, you need to be paying attention to really appreciate it. And it's very much a, a format that demands your attention. Mm -hmm. Like you have to physically mm -hmm. put the needle down. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have to flip it later. But you have to, it forces you to sit there and really listen and really appreciate what's happening. Those albums at that time were recorded the best. And they were pressed the best, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Those mastered tapes, even though the recordings were fairly simple, but they were still well done. And the music is in its right spot. Somebody who's interested maybe in starting a collection, how, where, how do they get started? I find that a lot of people that get started um, start uh, with thrift stores, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. bargain bins, you know, start cheap. You kind of just put, put your toe in the water, you know what I mean, set, test it out. But then there are other people that get started, I find, uh, just buying their favorite records does it they're not they're not trying to get a whole yeah, bunch yeah. and just they're not into the digging they come in the store and they're like you know where's green day's dookie <laughs> you yeah know? but then at some point there's not enough there to yeah. satisfy the hunger the craving <laughs> that's right, right? yeah so then they start going to real record stores and they they start oh geez he's playing that that's kind of interesting you know so i think a lot of times what you play in the store uh, we played Traffic, Little Spark of High Hill Boys today. Three people came up at the cash out of nowhere and made a comment about that record. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, wow, you know that record? Well, I think every yeah. music lover has had that experience. <laughs> They've just walked into a music store and heard something obscure but amazing and just yeah. had to say, what was that? Yes. Yeah. I distinctly yep. remember one day in Toronto, Killing Time, I was walking uh, around the beaches. I went into, I can never remember the name of the record shop, but there was a guy in there playing, uh, I think it was Velvet Underground, and he was just spinning whatever songs he felt like, and just watching him throw on different 45s and different full lengths and everything, I stopped shopping, and I just kind of watched him <laughs> do his job for... Yeah an embarrassingly long time but it was so fascinating to me and just seeing how he was curating that sound in the shop so he was doing that for himself or for the customers i don't think he even saw me come in i was the only person in yeah, the he's store probably so into it yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. yeah it's not like you're educating people but at the same time you don't want to really offend anybody so you're playing music that's kind of interesting you want to play some new stuff and then you want to play some old classics but yeah i, I think it's just a fascinating time to be in the music business. Yeah, hats off to Matt. I mean, you know, this is his passion, and uh, I think he'll be very successful at Thanks, it because Jerry. most people that are are, are totally into it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen record stores in Toronto come and go, uh, and, I mean, there was a record number there a while back. They have record stores in Toronto. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's still. And they jumped on the bandwagon because they thought, oh, well, that guy's successful or that guy's successful. I can do the same thing. But they didn't have the passion for it. They wouldn't work 24-7 at it. They didn't have the feel. And they didn't really have, I'll say, musical knowledge in the sense that they weren't ready to dig in and learn because it wasn't their thing. What would you guys say to someone who would say that the resurgence of vinyl is just a fad? Well, people were telling us that 15 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know... I've got to admit, in 2013, 
that's when I left Sonic Boom and then I went to pursue teaching and um, I, I thought it was peaking. And it has grown so much <laughs> since 2013. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say uh, the the statistics do not support that ar argument. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can't see it ending really, um, just because of the format. It, it sounds good, and it's the whole ritual of taking the record out and playing it and looking at the jacket and reading the liner notes. Yeah. On that documentary we were talking about, somebody likened it to uh, like a wine connoisseur uh, smelling the cork. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. You're taking yeah. the vinyl out and putting it on the turn. It's like a ritual. Yeah, yeah. it's like a ritual. I think for people that, that are, are really not that into music, you had you had the camps of people you said earlier. Some are kind of casually into it, some are more into it. That, that's an argument or a, a position from someone that's really not that in, in, into music. So they don't understand, right? They're like, why Why would anybody buy, buy vinyl? This has mm -hmm. kind of got to be a fad. But it's, I believe it's it's a reaction to digital music. You know, back in the early 2000s, um, everybody started selling their CDs. Because they're like, hey, I can just download music or stream music or whatever. And then I think for all those people that you were mentioning, John, that you know, love music and they connect to albums, um, there was something missing in their life, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. Um, and, you know, I love vinyl, but I also like CDs and tapes. Like, you know, like I, I, and I just think people went back to vinyl for a lot of reasons, but I think it's, to them, it's something pure, you know? It's like, I think the, the, the CD kind of seemed like a smaller version of the real thing. It, you know, it's like you got the real album and then, oh, it's, there's the CD copy of the album. You know what I mean? So I think once everyone went digital, those people that want music in their lives and connect to it and want albums, um, yeah, they started going for vinyl and it just grew from there. So I don't think it's a fad. I think it's a, it's a reaction to the, the changing times and technology in, our, in the industry. Matt? Jerry, thanks so much for coming in and, and talking vinyl with us today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, when, when is Record Store Day? April 13th. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We'll see you then. All right. Yeah, okay. So you're going to make the rounds to all the stores? Oh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently there's a lot of them. Yeah, yep. yeah. And yeah. Uh, and Brian's included, and we'll, we got to talk to Brian, too. Now I'm recording. Thank you for asking. Awesome. Well, this is the uh, first on-location edition of any segment on the Kingston Live podcast. We are inside the newly renovated Brian's Record Option with Brian Lipson himself. Brian, yeah. you're doing an amazing job in here. The We know all know about the flood that happened back in August now. Was there any point in that whole process where you almost lost faith, where you thought maybe it wasn't ever coming back? In the beginning, when I saw, if, if you Google Brian's, uh, Brian's record option uh, flood and you see the water, the video's still up there, and you see the water pouring out, and I thought, oh my God, it's been a great 40 years, but that's it. And I said that to the WIG. They were interviewing me as I was going to my house, and the headlines was Brian's record option about to close. And, uh, but then I came back here, and I said, well, wait a minute from my knees down everything is destroyed my whole basement is destroyed but 70 percent of my product is still there and then when the community saw that newspaper thing that brian's record option is about to close that stirred something in the community and, and they said no you can't close and that sort of i mean how can you say no after that happens and i was hanging out here i was walking the streets People were coming up to me, putting money and checks in my pockets. I mean, I even had panhandlers come over to me and, and, give, and give me hugs. I mean, I mean, my goodness. I mean, I, I have more than they do, and yet they feel sorry for me. And, or I was, okay, I was on, I live on Division Street, and I'm going to Montreal Street to get something to eat. It took me six hours to get from Division Street to Montreal Street. Every, I would go a block, someone would, would uh, get out of their cars and we would talk and then I would get another block and someone else and then someone would give me a $50 and say, buy a bottle of wine. <laughs> and, uh, or then I, I'm in front of McBurney Park and this woman gets out of her car someone I, I don't know at all, and she, she gives me a hug, and then she goes back into her car. I go another block, and someone's giving me legal advice across the street. <laughs> and, and I mean, I mean it, it's just, it was out of Monty Python. But anyways, it's been, a, it's been quite a process. 
Absolutely. I wouldn't want to go through it. I wouldn't want anyone to go through this. But, you know, at least seven months later, like, I, I can't believe that I've, I haven't been selling records for seven months. Have you so, been surprised by the outpouring from the community? I'm amazed. The I'm, I'm amazed. I'm, I'm touched by everybody. And I, you know, I don't know what to, I don't know how to uh, reciprocate. And I say to people like, uh, how do I, what do I do? And everyone says open. you know so i mean you know so it's i guess i struck a chord here um i mean for me i've just i I just opened up a store i like music and i like to talk and and i just do my thing but i never thought that uh it had an impact on anyone really i mean it's just it's just a store the thing about kingston it doesn't matter how famous you are anybody who's in trouble anyone if it's publicized people come and that's an amazing thing to know that people have your back it's 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 changed me i guess i'll probably be more community oriented i imagine you know i mean when someone comes in for something or another you know instead of brushing them off uh i would probably say sure uh you know i mean it's uh because since you know you you've you've gone through this yourself you know, but uh, until you've uh, experienced it, you just don't know. Is there anything you would like to say to all the people that supported you, all the people that helped and uh, the community as they came oh, out? I, to- I just love all of you guys. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I miss the, the interaction. I miss the conversations. I miss the stories. Even, even the people who came in who were a pain in the ass, <laughs> you know? <laughs> there weren't that many, but, uh, you know, it's... Uh, but, no, I just miss being in the store, going through everything. I mean, I've had leisure time for seven months, and it's been seven months of stress. I know everyone was buying me beers and this and that, and my weight just uh, came to a point where I wasn't that healthy. The first day that I came to the store to, uh, to do things here... Uh, my weight all of a sudden went right back to where it was. It was like it was like magic, you know. You want to lose weight? Come to Brian's Record Option and work. <laughs> well, Brian, we're really excited to uh, see you back on your feet. Really excited to see the the record store back to its full capacity, back to where it was, oh, yeah, and uh, yeah. we're super thrilled for your reopening. Well, thanks for uh, coming in, and uh, no, I appreciate it. Note that Brian's Record Options, Something Else Records, Now and Then, and Zap Records will all be participating in Record Store Day on April 13th. More info at recordstoredaycanada.ca. This has been Kingston Live for April 2019. We encourage you to rate us on your listening platform of choice. Kingston Live was produced at Titan Sound in Kingston, Ontario. Hosted by John Sanfilippo and Riley Jabor. Writing and research by Peter Sanfilippo. Executive producer Rob Howard. And thanks to the generous support of our friends at Tourism Kingston, who helped make this podcast possible. Check out the latest live music listings and many other experiences our great city has to offer at visitkingston.ca. We'd love to hear from you. Email your thoughts, ideas, comments to podcast at kingstonlive.ca.